Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Microbial Minutes for April 23rd, 2018. I'm Julie Wolf. I'm the Science Communications Specialist at the American Society for Microbiology, and this is our every couple week update on what's hot in the microbial sciences. Before we get into this week's news, I wanted to point out a conversation that I was listening to this weekend. Uh, we talked a couple of months ago about XDR typhoid fever, um, and that was really interesting but most of our conversations are only about five minutes. I highlight the report and we don't go in depth. Uh, and this particular episode of This Week in Microbiology from the last week um, talks about the typhoid fever problem um, in a little bit greater depth, highlighting the same reports that we talked about. They also highlight fungal virulence in tropical frogs, which we talked about last week. Um, so if you're interested in listening to that kind of more in-depth conversation, you can go to asm.org twim slash twim in order to listen to it. But this week, we're going to talk about some new reports. We've got five different reports to highlight. First, we're going to talk about some Ebola vaccine clinical trial data. Then we're going to move into microbes of New York City mice. From there, we'll move into another public health area looking at the air dryers in restrooms to dry your hands with. Are they just blowing dirty air? Next, we'll move into some plastic degrading bacterial enzymes. And we're going to finish with a bit on giant viruses that have specialized metabolic genes. Um, as always, go ahead and leave a comment in the chat box. Uh, we can address those at the end of the session. Or if you're listening to this not during the live session, leave a comment and we'll come back and answer it later on. Diving right in, we're going to start with a report from The Lancet Infectious Diseases. This is titled Determinants of Antibody Persistence Across Doses and Continents After Single Dose Recombinant VSV Ebola Virus Vaccination for Ebola Virus Disease, an Observational Cohort Study. It's uh, quite a mouthful, but the take home message from this report is that there are some promising results for a one jab long term Ebola vaccine, which is really good news. Obviously, a vaccine would be very useful in the event of another outbreak, like the type that we saw in Western Africa a few years ago. There have been several different types of vaccines undergoing clinical trials, and this one is a one-dose, one single inoculation vaccine that is a recombinant vesicular, vesicular stomatitis virus uh, that has had its glycoproteins, so these um, black dots that are kind of decorating the membrane of the virus, as you see over here on the right-hand side. Those have been replaced with the Ebola virus glycoprotein. So it's turned into um, the type of protein that would be recognized should Ebola virus infect an individual. And the hope is that by exposing somebody to this uh, VSV, which does not cause disease in humans, we would be able to have an immune response that would then block the native Ebola virus from infecting our cells. There have been some promising results on this so far, suggesting that immediately after inoculation, there are high antibody titers um, in individuals who've been vaccinated. But we don't know how long those high titers last, and that's what this study wants to look at. How long um, do those titers last? And they're going to look at some different cohorts of individuals who've been inoculated um, with this vaccine one or two years after vaccination. I, I should also mention that I got this um, lovely VSV um, vaccine strategy from the link that you see at the bottom there. So they looked at three different cohorts, one in Switzerland, shown here at the top, one in um, the Gabon um, in Africa, and one in Kenya, also in Africa. And you can see that all individuals of the different cohorts develop high titers of antibodies uh, within a few weeks, within a month after inoculation. And those high titers are seen across the board and are seen regardless of whether the individuals were given a high dose, low dose, or intermediate dose of that vaccine. Everybody gets high um, antibody um, titers, which is really great. Those high titers are maintained at the same level up to one uh, and even two years after inoculation, which is again, really promising. However, when the 
the researchers look at neutralizing antibody titers. Those are the types that would bind to that glycoprotein and inhibit it from interacting with the cellular ligand to become internalized into the host cell. Those titers drop quite quickly. About a month after inoculation, so 28 days post-inoculation, there are only 71% of the original antibody titers. Uh, and six months out, only 31% of those neutralizing antibodies remain. Now, that doesn't mean that it wouldn't help to um, make the course of disease lessened uh, by partially neutralizing that infection. Uh, and that has that's something that would remain to be tested, in part because there's not really a good assay for Ebola virus neutralization. The assay that they used here, I believe, was a neutralization of that VSV that has the Ebola glycoprotein. But Ebola virus itself is a very dangerous virus and hard to work with, um, and the, the neutralization assays are not um, exactly correlative. The research on these cohorts will continue. The um, Kenyan study is finished, but the other two cohorts from Geneva and um, from Gabon will continue for up to five years uh, in order to see how long these different antibody titers um, last. And even should the neutralizing antibody titers be shown to drop too quickly for this to have a long-term effect, these are still promising results for a single um, inoculation vaccine. You could imagine that in the case of an outbreak, we, one would need to quickly vaccinate and get uh, high titers of response within the neighboring community and within the healthcare workers and public health officials that are reacting to that outbreak. And this this virus does show, or I'm sorry, this vaccine does show a lot of promise in, in being effective in that type of situation. So this was picked up by several uh, mainstream news outlets. It was written up in Stat News, which was also published in Scientific American. Um, and one of the lead researchers was quoted as saying, this is really good news because the vaccine is destined for places where logistics are very difficult. Having to do booster shots would be very impractical in these regions. And that's exactly the case. You can imagine in some of the cities it, um, where an outbreak would occur, it would not be as difficult to follow up with a booster shot three or six months after the initial vaccination. But in more rural, rural areas or the, the villages that surround some of the cities, it could be difficult to follow up. And so a single dose inoculation is really the ideal case for an Ebola vaccine. Um, so always nice to start off with a positive note. We're going to move next into um, two different studies that were published in ASM's MBIO journal. These were done um, uh, simultaneously and, and really deserve to be talked about in the same um, uh, summary here uh, because they're both looking at the different microbes that are contained in mice. Uh, and so one of these studies is titled New York City House Mice as Potential Reservoirs for Pathogenic Bacteria and Antimicrobial Resistant Determinants. And the other study is titled Viral Diversity of House Mice in New York City. Uh, it's really surveying the different microbial types in the same mice. But the take home message from these two studies is that mice carry more human pathogenic bacteria than human pathogenic viruses. And so the way that this study was, was um, conducted is that different regions of New York City were surveyed. You can see that four of the five different boroughs were covered. Um, poor Staten Island was not covered, but they did have different um, regions that they measured within Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, and Manhattan. And within these different boroughs, certain buildings were um, surveyed and different rooms within those buildings were surveyed. Uh, and within those different rooms, there were traps that were set and mice that were caught and then could be investigated for the different microbes that that they might carry, and they, the researchers also collected droppings from mice that they, were, that they found in these same locations, since the droppings can act as a conduit to spread disease as well. So they wanted to ask whether or not the mice carry um, or could potentially transmit these human pathogens. They looked at over 400 mice in total over two years of surveillance. So that would take into account different times of the year when perhaps mice might be more likely to take shelter in human residences, for example, during the winter. Now, I said that the um, viruses were not human pathogenic, and so we're not going to concentrate on that part of the study as much. Um, there were some previously unknown viruses that were identified, and this does add to our general knowledge of viral diversity 
in rodents. Um, and so you can go ahead and check that out in the link below. But their more um, startling finding was in looking at bacteria that can cause disease in people. They looked for these different bacteria as listed in this table by trying to use PCR to amplify certain bacterial genes associated with all of these different species. And they were able to find um, at least the genomic material that was um, associated with several different human pathogenic species, including Salmonella, E. coli, Shigella, um, uh, Klebsiella, um, C. perfringens, Leptospira, and C. difficile. And all of these different microbes were identified solely by molecular testing. So just by looking at whether that genetic material is present, with the exception of C. difficile. They did um, culture C. difficile, and from those cultures were able to identify at least one of the isolates that was associated with human infection. Um, however, it is important to note that it's not determined, uh, if, for example, finding the DNA within a sample does not necessarily mean that there is infectious microbe in that same sample. Similarly, they wanted to see whether or not these mice that contained human pathogenic bacteria might also contain different determinants for antibiotic resistance. And so again, using molecular testing, they found PCRs that were positive for um, different types of genes that confer resistance to quinolones, macrolides, beta-lactams. These are very commonly used clinical antibiotics. Uh, and so this was picked up in a number of different places. Uh, it was shared by, it was written up in, in um, Stat News. They had this lovely little graphic of the mice traveling on the transit. I live in New York City and haven't seen mice um, on uh, their way to work in the subways, but I guess it's certainly possible. And in this write-up, they talked with Ian Lipkin, uh, the senior author of these both of these studies. Uh, and he said that the findings at least raise the possibility that a person could acquire a bacterial disease that is hard to treat from the different mice that um, may live in the same dwellings as people. This was also written up in the New York Times, unsurprisingly, since it is a New York-based study. Um, and here, Lipkin um, again says that he uh, presumes that the mice are largely carriers of the bacteria and are not actually sick sickened by the bacteria that they're carrying. Uh, the, the blog post in the New York Times also asked the question, should everyone get a cat? That might help us to control the resident mice population. Uh, and an, another researcher unrelated to this, um, these studies uh, did point out that cats have their own viruses. And so it's really impossible to completely free us from exposure from animal carried um, microbes. If you want to hear just a quick summary of the research itself, the um, Scientific American has their 60 Second Science podcast. You can just go ahead and um, either subscribe or just listen on the website that we've included in the links below. Uh, the title of that is New York City Mice Are Packed with Pathogens. We're going to move on to another um, public health related study. Uh, and that is also from an ASM journal. This one is Applied and Environmental Microbiology. And the title of this research paper is that deposition of bacteria and bacterial spores by bathroom hot air hand dryers. So the take home message of this is that air dryers may help spread hand and building bacteria. So these hot air hand dryers, or if, as I've just referred to them, the air dryers, um, are potentially spreading bacteria. That's what the, the researchers here want to look at, whether when you are blowing hot air onto your hands in a restroom, are you blowing microbes onto your hands? How sanitary are these? And does it compare uh, is it to just air drying your hands in the ambient air of the restroom, which some people just kind of shake off their hands um, without using those, those hot air hand dryers? The researchers also wanted to look at whether these hot air hand dryers could spread bacteria or bacterial spores throughout a building. And so they used a number of different culture techniques in order to capture the bacteria that are being spread after exposure to either air dryer or ambient bathroom air. They found a number of different um, bacteria that were able to grow on these different auger plates. After exposure to 30 seconds of air dryers, they saw an average of 18 to 60 colonies that would grow on those agar plates. And that was quite different from just leaving a plate open and exposed to the bathroom air for two minutes, where on average they would collect a single colony. However, they also wanted to mimic 
what would happen if the bathroom air were being forced onto the agar plate? The difference here is that the hand dryers should have a HEPA filter that would help to block any microbes from, from being blown directly onto the hands. So they thought maybe this would actually increase um, by, by blowing the bathroom ambient air with a fan, maybe there would be a larger amount of bacteria. They saw that that did increase the number of bacteria. They had 12 to 15 colonies on average, uh, but they, that still did not compare with using the air dryer itself. You can see that some um, human pathogens, as indicated in bold in this table, were found only after exposure to the ambient air, uh, such as Acinetobacter baumannii, uh, but that some, such as Staphylococcus aureus, were found only after the air dryer exposure and not in the ambient air. The researchers also wanted to ask about the presence of spore-forming colonies, especially if they, the spore-forming bacteria were being worked with in a distant part of the building, not necessarily in the bathroom themselves. Because, of course, in a lab environment, you could imagine that there are different labs within an academic institution or a research facility that are dealing with different types of microbes. And when they used a very specific type of Bacillus subtilis, this is a non-pathogenic spore-forming bacterium, they were able to find that 2.5 to 5% of the bacteria deposited on those agar plates after air dryer exposure were this, um, this same spore forming strain. And that was regardless of how far away the bathroom was from the spore forming lab that they, that they were holding the bacteria in. So this, uh, of course, has a lot of um, interest in public health. A lot of people who use restrooms are trying to figure out what's the cleanest way to, to dry hands. And so this was picked up by a number of different news outlets, including several mainstream news outlets. Here we have a, a report in the women's magazine Allure, um, where they spoke with the senior author, Peter Setlau, who said that the more bacteria that are deposited on hands and body, the more likely that you will get a potential pathogen on your hands and then into your mouth or eyes. You could get sick or transfer the bug to someone else. And that's certainly a possibility. You can see that this was widely shared on social media. I found a number of different people who are um, sharing this on their Twitter accounts. Uh, but I think that it is important to keep in mind that they were testing the presence of bacteria on agar plates that would allow any microbe that was deposited to start growing and form a colony. Unlike our hands, which have their own microbiome, and that means that the, the available niches for bacterial growth are not going to be as friendly or welcoming to all bacteria that are deposited. I think it, uh, it might be important to consider this particular study in the case of a hospital or a place where other immunocompromised people might need to minimize their exposure to different microbes. And that's most likely how this, this research will be interpreted. All right, we're going to move on to our next study. This one was from um, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, or PNAS. It's titled Characterization and Engineering of a Plastic Degrading Aromatic Polyesterase. Take home message from this is that scientists have improved the bacterial plastic degrading enzyme. So plastic is something that is ever present in our world. It's found um, on our appliances. Um, it's commonly uh, a common example is in water bottles that are available in grocery stores or corner markets, um, just about everywhere that we go. And the durability of plastic and the ability to to cheaply uh, make things affordable, such as a water bottle, or uh, you could use a toothbrush as an example. This is dual-sided because when these things are done being used, if the, the material breaks and we just throw it away, it is not very degradable. It just sits for uh, uh, hundreds or thousands of years before those long polymers, um, the repeating subunits that make up the different plastic components, can degrade into some of the more basic components that might be incorporated into microbial metabolism. However, in 2016, a new marine microbe was identified, Edionella sacaiensis, that can grow using polyethylene terephthalate, or PET, uh, as its major car carbon source. And it does this by secreting a PETase, which breaks down that polyethylene terephthalate, which is the major plastic in water bottles, uh, into some other more readily accessible compounds. 
And so this was um, a big deal when it was found a couple of years ago. But of course, scientists want to improve upon some of these natural processes, maybe to express the um, PETs to higher levels, we could spray it on some of our plastic before it's headed for the dump, uh, or maybe we could make it more efficient. And so th this research was really to look specifically at the characteristics of this PETase. And um, to, answer, to answer the question, would we be able to engineer a more effective version? As directly quoted from the abstract of this paper, um, the scientists say that by narrowing the binding cleft via mutation of two active site residues to conserved amino acids in cutinases, we surprisingly observe uh, improved PET degradation, suggesting that PETase is not fully optimized for crystalline PET degradation. And so dissecting this a little bit, it means that they were able to make just a couple of changes in the amino acid sequence of the protein, uh, and this allowed them to make a, a more efficient version of this enzyme. And they did this um, because this PETase looks very similar to another type of hydrolytic enzyme called a cutinase. And they saw that within the cutinase that the binding site as shown here, so this is the PETase shown in A and C here, has a really um, a wide mouth that allows um, uh, the PET to fit into that groove. And they, they said, okay, well, if we change two of those amino acid residues so that it looks more like the PE or looks more like the cutinase that is a, a homologous enzyme, then we'll end up with a smaller opening, as you can see in B and D. This is the engineered form where there's a slightly smaller cleft where the, the active substrate would fit in. And then they tested this by applying the enzyme directly to some polyethylene uh, terephthalate. And you can see that there was uh, here um, a smooth sheen of this particular um, plastic. And then they used the wild type or natural form of the enzyme, and they saw degradation as they had done before. You can see some of those holes that are within that um, plastic. That's the result of the PET ACE activity. But that engineered form actually had much larger holes. So more of that uh, film was degraded into some of the byproducts, uh, suggesting some very positive results for the future of engineering plastic uh, degradation. This was picked up by a couple of mainstream outlets. Uh, it was picked up by a number of outlets. And everyone who is concerned about the environment should be um, thrilled at these results. So The Guardian, um, a um, British newspaper, uh, was able to talk to one of the researchers who said that what we hope, what we are hoping to do is to use this enzyme to turn this plastic back into its original components so we can literally recycle it back into plastic. And wouldn't it be great if we no longer had to use oil um, or uh, some of those those crude oil to, um, byproducts in order to make plastic? We could literally recycle our plastic by breaking it down into the basic subunits and then building it back up into new plastic materials. The same researcher said that people are now searching vigorously for other types of plastic that could be broken down by bacteria that are currently evolving in the environment. And that would be exciting too, because PET is only one of the polymers that uh, is known to be a plastic um, polymer. Uh, this was also found, um, this is also written up in Science News. This is a, a trade um, newspaper or a trade um, website that highlighted the fact that this engineered PET could um, degrade both PET and another newer bio-based plastic called PEF. So um, not only was the engineered PETase more efficient, it could also break down additional types of plastic. Super promising. So this was shared by groups concerned about conservation, such as Planet Vision, groups interested in microbiology, since this is a microbial um, process, and just individuals who have a general interest in science. Uh, and I recommend checking out the, the paper if you are, have more interest in this particular process. All right, we're going to talk about our last uh, study. This is something from the journal Virology, and this is titled A Giant Virus Infecting Green Algae Encodes Key Fermentation Genes. And this is a topic that has just barely missed the cutoff in the last, type, last couple of microbial minutes because there's been quite a bit about different types of giant virus research that's been published um, in the last couple of months. So I'm glad that we're able to incorporate one of these studies. 
The take home message from this particular study is that a giant virus genome encodes fermentation genes, which is just kind of mind boggling when you think about how viruses have traditionally been defined as basically containing only their genes for um, gene expression and, and viral replication. <clears throat> Now, these giant viruses are a relatively new type of virus. They were only discovered, I believe, in 2004, the, the first Pandora virus, which is a very large virus, a giant virus. Uh, and since then, there have been a number of different viruses that have been found. These, these giant viruses are large not only in their size, they are generally larger than one micron, but also in genome. They have much larger genomes than some of the more traditional um, viruses that have been studied as large as 2.5 megabases. Nine of the 10 largest viral genomes have come from giant viruses found to infect the amoeba acanthamoeba. And the other is from a virus that infects the protist cafeteria Ro ronbergensis. Uh, and a lot of the um, viruses, of course, still rely on the host cell molecular machinery for replication, but they have been found to carry unusual genes, including those involved in um, different replicative properties or processes, such as the novel tRNA synthetase that was discovered in 2004. Now, this report is um, characterizing a new Mimi viridae family member that was discovered um, within green algae. This is a Tetracellus virus 1, or TETV1. So the researchers took the genome of this large um, TETV1 virus, and they characterized all of the different genes um, that they were able to identify through software identification. So taking things that looked like they contained an open reading frame. Uh, and they blasted or compared those sequences against known genes. And they found, of course, that many of them have no homologs, they are um, unknown in the viral world or other types of worlds. And then they have some that have similarity in their sequence or homology to bacterial genes, viral genes, and eukaryotic genes. And interestingly, in this table, they're able to um, characterize some genes that are in, uh, related to the ability to uh, conduct fermentation. This includes things such as the pyruvate for, uh, formate lyase activating enzyme, the pyruvate formate lyase, um, and others that are actually homologs or have similarity to eukaryotic genes. And this is the first time that fermentation or fermentation-like genes have been identified in a virus. It's really uh, an interesting process thinking about why this virus would carry these particular genes. Now, I should mention that these have only been identified by homology. They have not been shown um, to be functional uh, at the same way that their um, homolog uh, act in these different types of eukaryotes that they're known to be found in. Uh, but it does suggest that there is fermentation that can be conferred, a new type of metabolism that can be conferred via infection with a virus. So this was not picked up by um, news outlets, but it was widely discussed on Twitter. Um, so I, I found a few very interesting discussions that were ongoing, uh, including um, one user who took this to the next level, imagining that a human virus that could allow us to ferment our own systemic ethanol, which is, again, just a kind of a crazy sci-fi way to imagine um, some of the current findings in how they could be applied in the future. That's it for today's Microbial Minutes. Those are the some of the major um, microbial stories that have been circulating. And I uh, hope that you enjoyed this discussion. If you did, go ahead and subscribe, and you'll always get an update every time we're about to have another one of these sessions. Um, I Just to summarize what we have talked about, we talked about how promising results for a one-jab long-term Ebola vaccine show promise for that vaccine. We talked about mice that carry more human pathogenic bacteria than viruses. We talked about air dryers that may help spread hand and building bacteria. We discussed scientists um, who have improved bacterial plastic degrading enzymes. And we talked about how giant virus genome can encode fermentation genes. Um, 
I don't see any particular questions, so I will come back uh, again. Feel free to leave your questions in the comments, and I'll talk to you next time.